Well, we are in Matthew, uh, starting in, in uh, chapter 25, verse 31. So let me give you a little heads up. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus is right in the middle of talking about the end of days. So everybody pay attention. Let me show you where we're going today. We're going to fast forward to the end of history. So because Jesus is God, he knows what's going to happen at the end of history. Like many, we don't even know what's going to happen in the next five minutes of our lives. Uh, Jesus knows what's going to happen at the, at the end of history. So everybody pay attention. He's going to pull the veil back for a second, and we are going to look behind the curtain and see what happens when God closes up history. And that's what's happening here. Jesus is going to let it, give us a little insight into that in Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes, so the Son of Man is another name for Jesus. He's speaking of himself. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him, all will be gathered the nations. So underline all the nations. And he will be, and he will separate, circle separate. He will separate people one from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit, circle inherit. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink and when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart, circle depart, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, circle eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, underline devil and his angels, for I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will answer also, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. Underline verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, circle eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, circle eternal life. Ready? If there ever was a sermon that directly relates to you, it's this one. And here's the reason why. Many of you could say, oh, this you sit in a service and you go, it didn't really relate to me. It was on parenting. I'm, I'm a single woman or whatever, I'm not blah, blah, blah. Listen to me. You're in Matthew 25. I'm in Matthew 25. Literally every person who's ever lived is in Matthew 25. From the very first person God made, Adam, to the last day of history, whenever that is, we're somewhere in here. I want you to understand, every person who's ever lived is in Matthew 25. This directly relates to you and me and every person who's ever, ever, ever lived. We're going to take a look at, um, as part of our series today, called Satan's Greatest Hits, Lies We Believe. And one of the lies that we believe in our culture is permeated throughout not only our American culture, but actually in the church as well. It's even some of the churches in our valley. And so I'm going to go after this particular aspect today because I want you to understand the love of God and the results of not responding to the love of God. So there's the love of God. And then there's the response that's required to the love of God. So let's take a look at it. If you got your notes, pull them out. They should be in your bulletin if you got a bulletin when you came on campus. By the way, how are my, how are my patio people? <laughs> Speaking of hell, you're suffering out there in like a <laughs> 95 degree heat. If you got your notes, pull them out. They should be in the bulletin. Um, if you're online with us right now, at the top of the comment section on Facebook is a link, and uh, you click on that link and my notes will pop up. Number one is this. Here's the cultural belief of our moment. I'm going to fix something in your mind. 
I'm going to clarify what has been poisoned by Twitter and Oprah and some of the church teaching you've had because of what Jesus says, not because of what I want it to be, literally from Jesus' own words. So if you understand what I'm telling you isn't what I want to speak on it about. It's literally from Jesus. If you don't like it, talk to Jesus about it. Okay, here we go. Here's our cultural lie. Here's the cultural lie of our moment is this. The gospel, the good news in the Bible, the gospel is that God wants to change the world. Ready? You've heard this whole line. Christians are to proclaim that God wants to transform the culture through social good. God's grace on people isn't to save people from sin or punish rebellion against him, but rather to express his love by believers doing positive things and helping others. Doesn't that sound awesome? Hey, you want to know what the gospel is? The good news of the Bible? The good news of the Bible is that people do good for other people. Our job as Christians is to do good so that other people see the good and they want to do good too. So God has a high value for our culture and he wants us to do good so other people see good. Their lives get better. Feed the homeless. Give clothes to people that don't have clothes. Help those who can't help themselves. When we see injustice, step into that moment. Our job is to just do good. Be do-gooders. Get good up in here. That's the whole purpose that God has for us. We got a little dance going on, which is sweet. Jesus is calling right now, so listen. Ready? This good work will eventually produce heaven on earth from which Jesus will rule. Ready? Here's our first principle. Everyone will be changed by the grace of God. You know what, the, what Scripture says? Scripture says that God loves everybody. And you know what that means? That means that everybody's loved by God, so everybody someday will get into heaven. You, me, Hitler, your grandma, that person that cut you off on the 15 that you said, go to church. <laughs> like everybody. I'm talking everyone. People that are alive, people that are dead, people that have done wickedness, people that are really good people. Everybody, because God loves everyone and God wants everybody to do good, we reach people by doing good and eventually everybody just goes to heaven. The grace of God just brings everybody in. Even if you don't want to go into heaven, God just shoves you in there like getting your kids in the van. Like, get in there. (laughs) You don't want to go to heaven? Doesn't matter. God's grace will get you there. Here's our first principle. Everyone will be changed by the grace of God. And you know what? That sounds great. Doesn't that sound awesome? That sounds almost like every sermon you've ever heard by most popular preachers. Hey, everyone's going to be changed by the grace of God. You know what our goal is? It's to do good in the world. Let's be do-gooders. Let's make good-gooder. Let's get a good. It sounds great. And number two is very similar to it. Also a lie. Love wins. Love wins. You probably read the book. It's one of the biggest pieces of satanic garbage that's come out in probably the last 20 years. It's love wins. And the idea is this. Hey, you know what? Is God love? Yep. Does God love all people? Yep. So if God is love and God can't fail, then his love for all people will bring people into heaven because love will win. Love wins the day. Love wins eternity. And here's what it looks like. God can't fail in his desire to love and save people. So either in this life or the next life, people will respond to his love and be saved into heaven. So here's the idea. The Hitlers of the world, mass murderers, killers, rapists, people that don't want to love God, they don't love people, they, just, they do wickedness their whole lives and they die. Well, guess what? They spend, they, for some reason, they're going to spend time in purgatory or whatever. We don't, really don't know what's going on, but they spend time in purgatory if you grew up Catholic. So they, they spend like 14 years or 15 million years, however long their sin is. And after a while, they just realize, wow, you know, God, I really want to go to heaven. 
And they respond to the grace of God out of purgatory or out of the mishmash of whatever second life they've got. We really don't know what it looks like, but uh, that's, that's how God reaches everybody. God's love wins here and there. Eventually, everybody gets into heaven. It's called universalism, which means universally everybody just goes there. Even if you don't want to go to heaven, even if you don't care about God, eventually you will. You know the problem with everything I just got done saying? is not one of that is true or in the Bible. Now let's look at the biblical truth, which is number three. The gospel is that God wants to change the person. Here it is. Ready? I'm going to do some heavy lifting. I want to change the way you think about your life and the world. Many times we get taught the cultural mode of today is, hey, let's do good in the culture. Twitter is like, what's the next great organization that we can jump on board with and do good? And we want to be affiliated with organizations. Hey, hashtag whatever organization you want to be affiliated with. And we put that up as a badge like, hey, I changed my profile picture because I support these guys or I support this thing or come give money to this thing. And, and we support a, a, whatever the next great organization is that our society goes, here, this is great, support this, give your money to this thing. Ready? Our culture is all about let's do social change. But you know what God's about? Let's do personal change first. And here's the reason. Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. God doesn't save people in a group. God doesn't throw a wet salvation blanket over people and go, you're saved. You know what God does? He does this. I save you. And 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 I save you. God saves people by individuals, not as a group. He doesn't save people so that a society gets saved. He saves people so that his good news gets out, which is this. Men and women who are loved by God can be reconciled to the God who loves them. And you know how that happens? He reaches people through people. Even if, so I'm preaching to a large group, but God doesn't save in groups. God saves by individuals even inside of a group. It's always individual. Here's the reason that's important to you. Listen to me. Many of us have thought this. Dude, I had a godly grandma. Grandma Fortis. <laughs> like good Nordics. Good Norwegian name. Dude, my grandma was godly. I was a total tool bag, but my grandma was godly. You know what's awesome? Is that I know because God loves my grandma some of grandma's good, good work is going to come into my life. Like God's going to save me because he saved my grandma. My grandma, did, my grandma did the godly work for two of us. Or you know what? Another thing is this. Hey, I, go to, I have a great pastor. Dude, the pastor of the orchard, he's kind of lame. But the other pastor I go to, he's great. And I know because I, I get good biblical teaching and because it's a great godly place and I think he's a good godly man, that because I go to the right church, man, God, God forgives my sin. Like, everything's all good. Or I, I have a pope, or I have a priest, or I have a pastor, or I have a great godly grandmother. Let me help you. There's zero godliness from other people that's attributed to you or me. Nobody else's godliness comes into our lives. That means this. You and I have to personally come to Christ. Why? Because God loves you personally. He doesn't love a group. He loves individuals in the group. Everybody understand what I'm saying? That's why, that's why this is huge. If you're trusting in a church or a pastor or a priest or a pope or somebody else to do God's work in your life, you're mistaken. Scripture always speaks of you individually need to get saved. God doesn't tell a whole group, everybody gets saved, I'm going to save everybody. He says this, everybody in the group, turn to Christ. Everybody, come to know Jesus as your Savior personally. Because nobody else's righteousness is going to be attributed to you. You have to repent of your own sin. It always has to be personal. Nobody's going to cover your gap. It has to be between you and Jesus. So our goal as Christians is not to do good in society primarily. Our goal is to get saved, have a relationship with Jesus, and then do good to shine the light of Christ in the world so that people see the light of Jesus in you and go, what's different about you? I need to get saved. Because what good does it do if you do good in the world, but everybody goes to hell? 
Literally, life isn't about getting on the right organization to do good in the world. Life is about getting right with God and then doing good to shine the good God into the world so that people who are lost see the goodness of God in your life. That's the gospel. You need to get saved, and then you need to be a better husband. You need to be a better wife. You need to be a better student. Jesus has to transform how you date, how you spend your money, how you, how, what your mouth is like on the job tomorrow morning. When Jesus transforms your heart from the inside out, then people go, what's your deal? And then Jesus reaches ones through you. Jesus uses one to reach one. Whether it's your family, whether it's people at your work. The Bible says that God created and loves humans, but people are born with a sinful spiritual nature that rebels against him. This depraved, unfixable condition requires a transformative miracle of the heart by God's grace. Hey, how many of you guys have kids? So this service is packed with kids. How many of you guys have ever been a kid? How many of you guys didn't raise your hand because you're like, I don't listen to pastors? And you're not doing it now, right? So, ready? You're a perfect example of what I'm talking about. I don't have to listen to you. No, I don't have to raise my hand about anything. Because we are built, if you, if you have children, you know this. If you were a child, which all of us were, you also know this. For those of us that are parents, here's the thing. You can't understand why your kids rebel against you. Like, why, why, why do you talk back to me, daughter? Why, why are you like this, son? Wait, time out. Wait, we, hey, we need to talk about something. You see the light that's on in your room? That comes from electricity <laughs> that daddy pays for every month. Literally, I screwed the light bulb in in your room. You didn't buy the light bulb. Daddy did. Oh, you know the food that you shoveled in your mouth, my 300-pound son? Oh, Mommy went to work and got a J-O-B to feed your large mouth. <laughs> oh, you love the air conditioning that unit that's been running for five days? Daddy has to pay that electric bill so you stay cool in your little room so you can be on the phone I purchased with the plan that also allows you to surf the interwebs. <laughs> you know who did that? Daddy does. And so when you talk back to me, not only do I want to rearrange your face, but I do... <laughs> Wonder why you would do that. You're an adult son. Why in the world are you talking back to me like that? You want to know why? I'm going to tell you. If you have kids, if you're a parent, you know, you don't understand why your kids are rebellious. Like, literally, there's no reason. You make their life work. Like, their life only works because you're in it. And so for them to talk back to you, for them to talk trash to you, for them to be disrespectful or like, whatever, I don't have to listen to you. You're like, what? You're literally only here because I produced you into the world. <laughs> and if you don't have kids, you're like a single person or you know, you're younger or whatever, listen to me. You were a kid at one time and your parents were like, dude, what is wrong with your brain? <laughs> what, what is wrong with you? I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. Ready? You, were, you and I were born, every single person is born with an inward-focused, selfish uh, character. It's called sin. It means everything's about me. I manipulate you, or I hate on you, or I disrespect you if it makes me feel better. Everything's about me. That's, that's a self-focused, sinful attitude. Well, guess what? The exact same thing you're tasting when you deal with people one-on-one -on -one is the exact same thing that we deal with with God, where we disrespect God. God literally made the world. He literally made you. He literally gives you everything, gravity and air and beautiful outdoors. He gives you everything. And yet we live our lives as if God doesn't exist. And if he does exist, I really don't care. So watch this. We live our whole lives in rebellion against God. Always self-focused. But you know what's crazy about the God of the Bible? Is he loves you even on your worst day. He loves you when you don't love him. You're an atheist. You're like, I couldn't kill us. All this stuff is like, Meh, God, God, whatever. I don't even believe in that stuff. Guess what? Even on the day when you don't even care about God, God still loves you. That's the great massive love of God. It's unending. It's, you can't fathom the love God has for you. In the same way that parents, we love our kids, even when they're disrespectful, 
Guess what? There comes a day, and it happened to some of us in here, where our parents, though we love us, had to kick us out. There were days that sometimes you as a, as a adult, young adult man or young adult woman in the house, you're bringing drugs into the home, and your parents go, you're gone. I told you the last time you're going to bring this in here, you're not going to be here anymore. You're not going to bring destruction into my home. You're, you're an adult that can make a real decision. You're going to rebel against me. I still love you, but we can't be together. Literally, love sometimes separates. We live in a culture where love has to be a feeling. And like, if I don't feel good, I'm not loved. Actually, in the Bible, love is a verb. Love is always action. You know how your wife knows you love her if you're a husband? Is if you actually act in love toward her. You know how a, a, a husband feels love? Is when a wife verbally respects and, and, and loves on her husband. It's always a verb. It's not buttery fly feelings in your heart. Because those butterflies die quick. <laughs> and some of us shoot them all. <laughs> Ready? So here's my point. My point is this. Sometimes love puts a line in the sand and says, I want you in my life, son, daughter. I want you to be in this home. I love you. I gave you this whole life. I literally produced you. I want you in my home. I love you. But when the kid goes, I'm not going to live by your rules. I don't love you. Uh, I'm going to do drugs. I'm going to get high. I'm going to do whatever. Then literally, love says we can't be together. We have to be separated because I'm not going to let you bring death and destruction into my home. And guess what? It's dysfunctional parenting to facilitate that kind of behavior where I just keep on facilitating death and destruction of my, of my kid. I literally hate my kid if I keep on funding his dis dysfunction and destruction. That's bad parenting. But we live in a culture where it's just open game on parenting. You, do, you, know, you don't want your kids to feel bad, and so you keep on greasing the skids away from God. So ready? Same thing with God. God loves us every single day. God calls us to him every single day. Come feel the love of God. And we go, nope, not interested in that. I don't want you running my life. And so guess what? Hell is just an extension of the way you've lived this life, which is, I don't want God. Eternity is just an extension of this. I don't want God in this life, and you won't have God in the next. Look at this. People need a heart transplant. What do you need? You need a heart transplant. I don't know how many of you have ever had a heart transplant, but it's like a miracle of medical engineering where they can literally give you a new heart. Funk, funk. Hey, I'm alive. Or if parts of your heart don't work, hey, look at that pig over there. Let's take some parts out of him and fix your heart valves. I mean, it's, it's a miracle of, of medical engineering that they can keep you alive, literally swapping heart parts out. Scripture speaks of the same thing. That's physical, but spiritually you need a new heart. One that stops rebelling against God, one that's soft to the things of God, one that says, I want to be a woman of God. I want to be a man of God. That heart, that has to come from God. And it only comes through repenting of your sin, stopping your rebellion against God and saying, God, I want you to change my life. Jesus, I want you to transform who I am. I don't have a, a, the right spiritual heart. Swap out a new heart in me so I can serve you and serve other people. Look at John 3.16. John 3.16 through 18. Also the words of Jesus. He says this, for God so loved the what? The world. Watch this. So that sounds like, hey, God's going to save everybody. Except you got to keep going. For God so loved the world. Does he love everybody? Yep. Does he love all 7.5763.4517 billion of us? Yep. But here's the issue. Ready? It's not that God doesn't love us. It's that we don't love God. And look at the rest of this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, speaking of Jesus, that whoever, that's personal, singular, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. God wants to give you everlasting life. He wants to forgive your sin. He wants you to have a life eternal, the best life here and the best life for eternity. Like that's God's heart. He's not trying to rip people off. He's not trying to keep people out. He's trying to go, I'm at the door's open, son. Come back home. But we go, nope, I'm not going to believe in you because then i got to change. And I run my life. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved, what? Through him. 
Look at the rest of the verses. Whoever believes in the Son, whoever believes in Him is not condemned. So this is singular. You've got to get saved. You yourself have to get saved. It's not on grandma. It's not on me as your pastor. It's not on anyone else. You, whoever believes. God loves the whole world. That includes you. But you yourself have to come to a knowledge and acceptance of Jesus and stop running from God. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he, singular, personal, has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Ready? God doesn't save groups. God saves individuals. Can you look at your life and go, I've done that. I'm not trusting in grandma or a pastor or a pope or a priest or a church or an organization. I'm literally trusting in Jesus personally on my own because that's what God's talking about here. Look at Romans 3, 9 through 12. Romans 3, 9 through 12. What then? So this is Paul the Apostle speaking. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. It's basically everybody in the whole world. He's talking about salvation. He says this, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all people, both Jews and Greeks, so Greeks is the word kind of, that means everybody who aren't Jews, are under sin. As it is written, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All of us have turned aside, and together we've all become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So watch. The gospel isn't you go do good in the world to change culture. The gospel is this. You need to change so that the good of Jesus shines through you into culture. So people in the culture see Jesus, and they get saved too. That's the gospel. Stop thinking, stop thinking the, the crowdfunding you give to and the good organizations, the hashtag, whatever organization you put on your Facebook or whatever, that you're doing God's work in the world. God's work is for you to get saved if you're not a Christian and then reach out with the love of God to help others. It's not that it's wrong to do good with organizations. Nothing wrong with it. But my point is this. That's not your Christianity. Your Christianity isn't in what organizations do. Your Christianity is in how you reflect Jesus in the world. Look at this. While God cares about culture, he changes people by changing the person. Here's our principle. Social good is a result of the gospel, not the goal of it. Listen to me. I'm going to say it again, especially you young people. Hey, you're under 107. Listen to what I'm saying. Then we're all young. I just helped you. See how I helped you in self-image? Ready? Everybody in here, listen to me, especially if you grew up in the social media age. You're in your teens right now or in your early 20s. And you know what the hot thing is? Hey, what organizations do you, do you support? How come you don't support X, Y, Z, whatever it's called? And you feel social pressure to jump in, in, in with that organization. And you think when you put the new hashtag up there, or you think when you give in a crowdfunding to that organization that you're doing good in the world. You might be helping an organization. You might actually be doing some social good. But here's my thing. Don't mistake that for doing good for God. Because doing good for God is knowing who Jesus is, having your life transformed, and then shining your light out into the world so that other people see Jesus in you so they get saved. It doesn't do any good to, to clothe the hungry and to feed other people and to do all this other stuff and hashtag whatever if those people don't see Jesus in you. It's, it's wasted movement of, of goodness because at the end of history, all of that just gets, is gone. All that's left are people. In the last judgment, all that'll be left is people. And you want to make sure that you and I have walked with God so that they know who the cr true God is and stay out of the judgment of God. So, number one, the gospel is that God wants to change the world. Nope. Number two, love wins, which means eventually everybody makes it into heaven. Jesus says right here in Matthew 25, that's not even true. I don't even know why people preach that. Number three, the truth is this. The gospel is that God wants to change the person. God loves you. God wants your life to change. God doesn't love you through someone else. God loves you individually because he made you and he cares about you. And lastly, number four is this. Love doesn't win. God wins. God wins. And here's what that looks like. 
Jesus, like I just read in Matthew 25, and every New Testament author validates that hell is real and lasts forever. Look at this. Look at, um, look at Matthew 25. You were just there. Matthew 25, 41. And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire. So this is fire that burns forever. Humans were not made to go to hell. Hell was not designed for humans. It was designed for Satan and, and angelic, angelic beings and demons to be away from God. Because watch this. Let me clarify something for you. Angels and demons are eternal because they're moral creatures. You and I are eternal. We're moral creatures. We will never stop existing. So at your funeral, your body may lay in, in, a, in a casket, but who you are is gone. Like your physical, all your, like you can't do surgery and find your soul. And what your soul is, is the thing that, it's not your consciousness. It's not the thing that makes you conscious. It's, it's your place of your will. It's where you make your decisions. And that can't be found. It's not in your brain. It's not in your heart. It's not in your feet. Nobody can find the place where, you, where your will is. Scripture speaks of that as your soul, which means it's the thing that makes me, me. It's, it's how I'm built. It's the decisions I make in my life. That's, that's me. That's my soul, not this body. That part of me will now go on into eternity forever, either forgiven with God in, in heaven or unforgiven saying, I don't need God in my life. I've rejected God my whole life, and now God honors me with judging me for my sin that's, that's unforgiven for eternity, and he separates me from himself. Not because he wants to, but because I've chosen that. In, a, in many respects, hell isn't God, an angry God going, get out of here. Hell is God saying, I give you what you've always asked for, which is being apart from me. So the grace I give you in this life, hey, please come to me. Please come to me. Please stop your sin. Ends when I die. And now hell is just the gracelessness of God. Though God has loved me my whole life. Hell is described as darkness and fire, and worms, and anger, and suffering, and regret, and isolation. <sighs> Could it be worse? Think about that. Listen to me. Let's walk into hell for a second. Actually, speaking of hell, did you know that uh, Death Valley just had like 130 this last week? Just happened to be on the same week I'm teaching on hell. How ironic was that? <laughs> Literally, it's the hottest recording in human history. Death Valley got hit 130 I thought Hemet was bad. So listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Had to get that in there for all my Hemetites, okay? Ready? Hell isn't God going, I'm really mad. I'm going to do something scary. God is saying this. I begged you to come to me your whole life. I literally gave you this beautiful world to know that I'm real and to repent of your sin. I gave you a conscience that tells you don't do that anymore. Stop doing that. You feel bad. You feel guilty. You feel dirty. That's from me. It should propel you to seek out forgiveness. And you said no to me your whole life. So it isn't on me you go to hell. It's literally on you. I've done everything I can to reach you. I can't do any more. I sent my son to die for you. Understand that hell is the worst of all realities. It's so almost hard to describe that it's described as fire and darkness. Well, in our day, obviously, fire gives off light. So how can there be darkness and fire? But there's the reality that there's some kind of suffering in the darkness. You're alone. It's, it's described as a place you never want to be. So I was watching Futurama. How many... Um... Oh, so we do have some nerds in here. Okay, good, actually. <laughs> Second service is like, I can't even spell Futurama. So Futurama is like an animation and uh, so I'm watching animation on, uh, on Adult Swim. And so I see one of the characters in this animation episode was Satan. And so Satan is displayed, it was perfectly displayed as the American hell and Satan. And I'm going to lay this out for you and you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about because you've literally been taught this by our culture your whole life. Satan was, what color was Satan? Red. red. Did Satan have horns? Yeah. Satan had horns. So there's a red robot with metal horns and Satan is running hell because Satan runs hell. He's like the president of hell. And so hell is this like weird glowy place with like some fire. And Satan, who has horns and a pitchfork, of course, uh, he's going around kind of telling people what to do. So that's the cultural understanding of hell. Jesus says hell is exactly the opposite. God runs hell. Satan 
and his angels belong there. They'll be punished for eternity. Nobody runs hell. It's not a hotel. I don't know how many of you guys grew up in the 80s uh, with like ACDC and uh, where's all my Hessian people in here? Is there any, uh, any, any of my rockers left? Okay, you don't have as much hair, but you still remember those, the music? I remember when I was in high school, people would listen to music, you know, like a lot of the rock music of the 80s was like, man, I'm going to hell and all my friends are going to be there. We're going to party. Here. Man, I'm going to see you in hell. We're going to party when we get there. Man, it's going to be a great time. You know what? I'd rather be with my friends in hell than be alone up in heaven. You know what hell's described as? The true hell? You're all by yourself. You're suffering. You're in the dark. You don't see anything. And there's some level of regret and anger and pain for eternity. It's the absolute worst reality as a human you could fathom to see no one ever again forever with no opportunity to repent. Why? Because this is your opportunity right now. This is the life where you get your second, third, fourth, 20th, 80th, billionth chance. God literally beckons you every second of every day. Come to me. And we just go, nope, not right now, or I don't believe in you, or whatever. And at the end of life, it's like, I give you what you ask for. Look at this. It was made to punish fallen angels, not humans. But as humans spiritually exist forever, sinful humans remain sinful forever, unless transformed by faith in Christ in this life. I can remember in high school, people would talk about hell, like kind of like I know, and I go, you know why I don't believe in hell? You know why I don't believe in your scary little God of the Bible? It's because one, people just talk about that. It's probably made up by the Catholic Church, number one, to scare people, to give money. Number one, that's why I don't believe in it. And number two, I'm going to tell you, you want to talk about ridiculous? Why would a God punish people eternally for like 70 years of sin? Literally, why? So, oh, so you do 50 years of sin and God's so like he can't handle it, so he just he, he punishes you for eternity for 50 years? That doesn't seem right. And then somebody shared an illustration with me and fixed my wagon. She had this illustration. Let's say that somebody breaks into your house tonight and they don't have a, their flashlight doesn't work and so they, they rummage around in your house looking for bread and they get into your kitchen. They finally, it takes them an hour to find a loaf of bread and they, they jack your bread out of the bread box. Anybody got a bread box in here? <laughs> we do. My wife loves bread boxes. So they <laughs> jack bread out of the bread box. They steal it and take off. It takes them like an hour and 15 minutes to steal a dollar oh nine uh, loaf of bread. But then somebody walking along your street sees the guy leave the house and sees a door open and he runs in the house with his gun and he murders you in your bed and takes off. And it literally takes him 13 seconds to kill you. They're both crimes. So the length of the crime isn't the length of the punishment because if the guy gets caught with the bread, even though it took him an hour and 15 minutes, probably won't even get a ticket. But the guy that murdered you in cold blood, guess what? He's probably going to go away for the rest of his life. And it only took him 13 seconds to kill you. So it isn't the length of time that it took to do a crime. It's the motive by which it was done. It's the gravity of the crime that dictates how long punishment is. So watch this. If, if that person murdered you, they'll go away probably, unless you're in a a, uh, a state that still has capital punishment. But even if you don't believe in capital punishment, understand that most people say, well, then he's going away for the rest of his life. But in reality, you're still taking his life away. You're locking him up in a little cell to do nothing the rest of his life until he's dead. Either way, you're taking his life away. One's just sh shorter than the other. So you're still making a call to say, get out of our society forever. Don't come back. Like literally, because you murdered somebody, I'm taking your life away and putting you in a cell until you're dead. And we don't want to see you in our society again. So understand, even our society has rules just like that. It took you 13 seconds to murder a person, but now your life's over. Steal some bread, takes you an hour. Share a sandwich with your pastor or whatever. <laughs> so watch, same thing with God. It isn't about your 50 years of sin and eternal punishment. It's this idea. If you're a sinner in this life, and you die without forgiveness of Christ, you remain a sinner forever. 
So you don't go to hell for eternity because God's mad at 50 years of sin. You go to, to hell for eternity because you refuse to repent and you remain a sinner forever. Your nature never changed. So it's not about the amount of time you did sin. It's about the fact that your nature never changed. You will be that way forever. And that foreverness is God separating himself from you, not because he doesn't love you. It's because you don't want to be with God. Ready? People are not in hell for how long they sin, but for how long they will be a sinner. People aren't annihilated or given a second chance as a person's whole life is their chance. Hell isn't the absence of God's presence, but rather the absence of God's grace. And here's our last principle. I'm going to try to end good. <laughs> Don't you love how I chose this Sunday when we had children singing? <laughs> I just had, this just happened to fall on this. I'm like, Jesus, come on. But ready? Some of you guys need to hear this because you're far from God. And you think just doing good is going to make up for your sin. How many of you guys have ever been in debt? Where's my debt people? Oh, there's only like seven in here. We got some good money managers up in here. Ready? One of the worst things in life is to be buried in debt. Remember the Lamborghini you bought, but you can only afford a Ford truck? And you're like upside down, 200 grand on your truck. And then you bought, at the top of the market, you bought that house in the vineyard that was like 1.4 million, but you only got 16 bucks in the bank. And like every month, it's like, dude, I owe like 12 grand in, in like paying off my credit card debt. I got like $30,000 in credit card debt at like 30%. You know, the thing about debt is it's not real from a physical standpoint. It's not a piece of paper. You know what it is? It's an understanding you know in your mind, I owe somebody something. And that debt weighs on your mind every day you wake up thinking about that debt. You go to bed thinking about that debt. You want to know why? Because we're not designed to have a debt that's never paid. Now imagine this. You're a million, you're 1.4 upside down in debt. You're like, dude, I work at the drive through at McDonald's handing out, you know, coffee here on Rancho. And while that's an awesome job, it's not going to be paying off 1.4 million. I'm literally going to be dead and still owe money. And that depresses me. Well, guess what? Same thing is true with God. Imagine this. Imagine if a person said, how much debt you have, son? Well, like 1.4. I'm going to rip you a check. Anybody ever write a check anymore? I'm going to rip you a check. I'm going to Venmo you 1.4. Right? And you're like, you're going to Venmo me 1.4? You're going to rip a check? That's what, what are you doing? Like, I can't afford to pay that back. Nope, it's my grace to you. Your debt is paid. Imagine how that would transform your life. If somebody paid your truck off and your house off and 30 G's of, of, of credit card debt, you'd be like, God, this is the best day of my life. I feel free. There's like this huge weight lifted off my shoulder. I can live now. And then you go right back to Amazon. No, you stop that. Just, <laughs> right? Ready? Here's my point. Same thing with Jesus. We have a spiritual debt to God we will never pay. There's no amount of good work we can do, people we can feed, clothes we can give away that replaces the offense that we've been against God. But guess what? God loves us so much, he gives us salvation. And Jesus covers the debt we can never pay off. So watch, and I close with this. When you die, that debt is either paid or not paid. And the only person who can pay it is Jesus. If you're trusting in Jesus, your debt is paid. That's why you go into heaven. You go into heaven not because you did good works. You go into heaven because Jesus forgave your sin and gave you a new heart. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you will go into heaven still owing a debt that now you have to pay yourself, which is now eternal. But guess what? God still loves you. But now we've chosen to not love God. So my encouragement to you is this. On a really heavy Sunday, is your debt paid? Is your spiritual debt paid to God through Jesus? Because God loves you like that. God's love reaches us every day. So let's respond to God's love. Because that's the greatness of our God, to love us and do great things in our life through Jesus.